can we detect ships moving with warp drives? What are some budget telescope recommendations? And how could we use the sun as a telescope lens? All this and more in our overtime question show. I'm still outside, so that means that we're doing another overtime question show, but some really great questions, so let's get into it. Kirk Wagner, or faster than light flight requires tech that we don't know how to detect yet. So, I mean, I think the, the point is like, we may not be able to detect the flight that, you know, the, the, the way that faster than light aliens are using to explore space. But the point is, is that, that they're going to be going to destinations. And one of those destinations is going to be the earth. And if there's an infinite universe, and people are able to go faster than the speed of light, then there should be an infinite number of aliens who are traveling faster than the speed of light to infinite destinations. And many of those are going to be Earth an infinite number of times. So, you know, yeah, we may not be able to observe the aliens flying past, but we've definitely observed the aliens arriving on Earth with their giant spaceships. You know, if, if we can't detect them, even though they're arriving here on Earth, then have they really come here? You know, people always ask, people always say that, well, like, what if we can't, like, detect the aliens with anything that we, you know, we can't detect them scientifically, we can't measure them, you know, they're like in another dimension, man. I'm like, well, then they're not here. It's the equivalent of them being not here, right? If we can't, if we can't detect them, then they don't exist. Uh, Carl Sagan had this sort of great example in uh, the book Demon Haunted World, which, which was one of the most influential books that I've ever read. And, and he sort of talks about how you have a friend who has a who tells you they've got a dragon in their garage, you're like, Whoa, a dragon in your garage, can I see it? And he goes, Whoa, 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 it's an invisible dragon, you can't see it. Oh, that's no problem. You know, it's got to be like, physically there. So I can feel it, right? It's like, well, no, 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 it's an insubstantial dragon, it's invisible, and you can't feel it. But it, you know, it is there. Okay, no problem. I can use an infrared uh, sensor to be able to detect the warmth. No, no, no it doesn't give off any heat. You know, okay, no, no problem. Like, you know, I can detect neutrinos, I can, and it doesn't do any of those things. You're like, I don't think you have a dragon in your garage. Dark matter, dark energy? No. So imagine, right? Someone says, I have a dragon in my garage. And you're like, oh, okay, sure, sure you do. Yeah, he's like, and you're like, can I see it? And you're like, no, it's invisible. Okay, no problem. Um, but I should be able to detect its you know, it's present the weight of the dragon moving around on the floor. And he's like, Oh, yeah, come on and check this out. And you go and you look at the garage, you can see giant footprints moving around inside the garage as the gravity is pulling the dragon down, it is crunching the concrete as it's moving around. That's dark matter, right? So yeah, we can't see it. But boy, can we measure its gravity? Because it is it is 10 times as much as regular matter. So to go like, Oh, dark matter is like invisible, man. Yeah, not gravitationally. Adventures of Carl, a couple of my coworkers have been asking what is a good telescope under $200? What do you recommend? If you're if you've only got $200 to spend, I do not recommend a pair a telescope, I recommend a pair of binoculars. So a couple of people have been been mentioning this. Um, the Celestron 15 by 70 binoculars, they're astronomical binoculars, they're monsters, um, very big binoculars. And so the 15 is the magnification, the 70 is the size of the lenses 70 millimeters across on the lenses they are two giant lenses. Um, so those are the ones that I recommend for people and they cost between 50 and $100, depending on when they're on sale. And they are your just go to telescope like or gear like I use the binoculars daily, birds in the day stars at night. And with a pair of binoculars, you could see Saturn, you could see Jupiter, you can see the moon, you can see deep sky objects, globular clusters, you can see uh, Andromeda galaxy, you can see open star clusters, like there's a lot of stuff that you can see with a good pair of binoculars. And so I would rather get like, if you only got $200, I would get the best binoculars that I could that I could afford, and not try to get a telescope, the sort of minimum telescope to get 
is probably a six inch Dobsonian. I mean, I don't know if people make a four inch Dobsonian. That, that's, I mean, that's still pretty good. Um, but a six inch Dobsonian would be a good way to go. You can also get like a Celestron first scope. They're okay, but they're like small. I think they're 130 millimeter um, and made of cardboard, but they're like a hundred dollars. So what you don't want, and, and people don't really sell these anymore is the department store refractor, the sort of the, the long telescope on the really janky tripod that just falls apart when you try to use it. So, you know, it's been more like, I mean, you could get a used Dobsonian for $200 or maybe like a used telescope from someone else for $200. But, but you, but if you want to get like a, like a good entry telescope, you're looking at about $350 for a Dobsonian. And that's what I would get. Neil von Holtum, how hard would it be to use our sun as a magnifying glass? Yeah, you're talking about the solar gravitational lens. How hard would it be? All you would have to do is fly a spacecraft out to about 500 astronomical units away from the sun, um, which is say four times farther than any spacecraft has ever gone. And you'd want to do it in a reasonable amount of time. You wouldn't want to take 50 years to or yes, if you, it takes you 50 years to get to 150 AU, you'd need 200 years to get out to 600 AU. So you need to go fast. And so that's the tricky part about getting to the solar gravitational lens is that you've got to figure out a way to go really, really fast. I've got two interviews with Dr. Slava Turashev. He's the person who came up with the idea of the solar gravitational lens. So, so definitely, if you're interested in this topic, do a search on my channel for Slava Turashev. He's a treasure. He's one of my favorite people to interview. He's so much fun. Do will Juno still be operational when Clipper and Juice arrives? I mean, there's no reason like Juno is solar powered, so it's still operating. They've they keep doing extensions on its mission. And in recently, they've started sending Juno on much more dangerous trajectories. So now they've had it been doing flybys of Io, which is you have to get very close to the radiation environment around Jupiter. So they've moved into the YOLO mode of flying Juno, but hopefully it'll still be operational when when Clipper and Juice get there. Creative Wizard, could you briefly describe what the process was with SpaceX Mechzilla? Based on seeing the videos and reading it all, I could see was explosions. Well, all right, I'm not sure sort of where we want to sort of begin this conversation. So originally, when SpaceX was developing their reusable rocketry with the Falcon 9, for example, these things land propulsively on a barge out in the sea, and then they bring them back. And as SpaceX was developing the fully reusable two stage rocket concept with the super heavy booster and the Starship, they realized that the amount of payload that they're going to be able to actually carry to space is relatively small for the for the size of the rocket. Now the benefit is that the whole thing is reusable, you don't throw at your rocket every time the way they do with with other rockets. But the only way to be able to achieve that full reusability was to shave off all of the weight from the rocket. And so one of the ways of saving a lot of weight is to not have any landing gear on your rocket. Like I think this is genius, right? The idea was, well, let's catch the rocket so it doesn't need to have landing gear. And instead, it just has some hard points on sort of up near the top that it can rest on. And so the booster when it does when it you know launches and you get the separation of the starship and then the booster flips around and then it fires its engines and it flies back to the launch site and then decelerates and then sort of brings itself close to the tower and then at the last minute when it's when it knew that it was able to make it without exploding it sort of shifted sideways and then on the launch tower the mechazilla it's got these big they call them chopsticks but these big arms that close in and those hard points they're like little knobs on the sides of the rocket just touch down on the tops of these chopsticks and then the chopsticks have a um you know they're able to kind of catch it and they have shock absorbers so that they sort of dip down when the rocket it sort of rests on top of it. And they were able to cut off tons of weight. I mean that like, like, you know, metric tons of weight off of the the dry mass of the super heavy booster by not having any kind of landing system on it beyond those little knobs that it gets caught with the chopsticks. So 
it's it's an incredible idea and it and it is by far the most exciting part of that entire flight five was that they actually pulled this off and caught it. Um, and the risks are huge, right? Because this thing is a bomb. And so imagine if it's a little off it, they don't quite make the catch and then the thing crashes into the launch gantry and explodes. And now you've not only lost the rocket, but you've lost the entire launch tower. So uh, to go this route is uh, scary. I can't I, like, I can't, I'm, I can just imagine the meeting. I mean, I wish I knew who actually came up with that idea and said, look, what if we don't, you know, we need a way to shave off the landing gear weight of this rocket. And someone was like, what if we don't have any landing gear? Wait, what? Yeah, it must have been incredible. Mangers 12. Fraser, this one has always confused me. Now my grandson has asked me and I'm unable to give him a satisfactory answer. How can the universe be infinite if it was created at the Big Bang? So this is one of the perennial questions that we get here on the channel. And I, you know, I feel like I need to answer this question every three episodes or so. Um, but good question, grandson. Here comes your answer. So, um, uh, so the first thing is to understand that when we talk about the universe, we're talking mostly about the observable universe that that when we look in one direction, we are able to see out to 46 and a half billion light years in one direction, we look the other way, we see 46 and a half billion light years, that is because the universe has been expanding and the amount of time that has elapsed is the age of the universe 13.8 billion years. And that if you sort of run the tape backwards, then you're going to see the size of the observable universe come down when it's just based on the amount of time that light has been able to to get across. And if you go roll all the way back, then about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the entire universe was kind of like the entire observable universe, like I gotta be really clear about this, the entire observable universe was like the surface of a star. And it was opaque. And then if you keep rolling the clock back, then there was a time when the entire observable universe, this is about like, you know, the first, say, 12 minutes after the Big Bang, the entire universe was like the interior of a star, very hot, fusion was happening, turning hydrogen into helium. And then theoretically, the entire observable universe say with me again, was the size of a volleyball or the size of a pea. we don't really know, or maybe it was almost infinitely small. But that was just the observable universe. And so outside of the observable universe was more universe, the actual universe. And we don't know how big that was, it might be that the actual universe was infinite that you, you we have our observable universe that is compressed down to the size of a volleyball. And then right next door is another one. And then right next door is another one. But you know, obviously, they're not you know, they're not spheres there. There's just that there's an infinite amount of universe it goes off in all directions. And then we got this lowering of density, this, you know, we call it expansion, but really, it's just that the universe was becoming less dense over time. But it could very well be that, that over the cosmic horizon, the places that we can, we can't see because the light hasn't reached us yet, there is just more universe. So if the universe is infinite today, it was probably infinite at the time of the Big Bang, that we're only seeing one tiny little portion of the true size. And we know that the universe that we can see is like less than one one thousandth of the volume of the actual universe, like we can measure the minimum volume of the real universe. And it is going to be about a 1000 times like the bare minimum is that it's a 1000 times bigger than the universe that we can see. So you imagine take the universe that we have, and then imagine a 1000 more packed in a volume, right? That's the bare minimum, but also maybe infinite it goes on forever in all directions. The classic question is, well, if the universe started as a singularity, how could we say that it's infinite today? And it's that the universe wasn't a singularity. The observable universe could have been a singularity. But there would still have been more universe outside of the observable universe. I hope you enjoyed this overtime question show. Now remember, the content that you're watching, this is from the audio that was recorded in the overtime segment of my weekly live stream. So it's two hours long, 
the first hour we turn into the question shows. The second hour is just random, off the cuff, a lot more casual, and yet sometimes we will dredge through it and we will turn it into question shows that we put on the main channel. But if you want all of it, if you like the gist, then you should definitely subscribe to our Patreon and you will get access to the patron-only podcast feed that contains all the additional audio for the overtime questions as well as the patron-only question show as well as interviews with the team and a lot of other stuff. So go to patreon.com slash universe today. Now I'm going to talk about some media that I'm watching, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, ScienceWorldRecord.org, Spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So a couple of great shows have come back onto the streams, and I've been watching them. So the first one, which I think you should watch if you haven't seen it, is Arcane. And this is loosely set, or maybe rigorously set, in the League of Legends universe, and I know that sounds crazy, and yet it is one of the best pieces of animation that I've ever seen. Both the story is just gripping and well told, and the animation style is incredible, and the art style sets it apart from any animation that you'll ever see. That I don't know how they do it, like they paint on top of the models and it just makes for a just really wonderful appearance and look and the every part of it is great. And so season two of Arcane has started up. I think they've, they're up to episode six released. This is gonna be the last season of Arcane, which I can't believe, but, um, but yeah, if you haven't caught Arcane yet, now's the chance to catch up and you'll be right in time to watch the end of the show. The second show that I have been watching now in season two is Silo, which is airing on Apple TV, which is, has more and more good to television, surprisingly. And so uh, Silo is, is great. It's set in this post-apocalyptic fallout shelter where people are living and have been living in this society for presumably hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And there's some grand conspiracy about what it's like to be outside of the silo. And so this is season, season two just started up and now we're learning what happened to the earth. And the show is great, both season one and now where it's going with season two, I'm really enjoying it. So two shows, if you haven't seen them already, Arcane and Silo. All right, we'll see you next time.